Hello medieval gaming enthusiasts, my name is AlzaboHD. In today's challenge video, we will seek to praise the sun and revive the rarest religion in all of Crusader Kings 3. By the 867 starting date, the Zunist faith of Afghanistan is dawn but not forgotten, and is by far the most difficult religion to legitimately revive in-game. In this challenge video, we will seek to restore the Zunbul dynasty and raise our solar religion in the light direction, all legitimately and of course through Iron Man mode. In the 867 starting date, the ancient Zunist faith was but a distant memory, but its ancestral patron dynasty, the Zunbuls, retained a county level holding in Bast as a subject of the Safarid Sultanate. Our story is centered along this region, placing us in control of Hermiz Jimafuda, the last remaining Zunbul of the recently conquered Zabulistan. It's time to praise the sun and begin our campaign in Iron Man mode. Our journey begins with Valley Hermes Jimafuda, the 21-year-old Count Level Leader of Bost and one of the last remaining members of the Zunbul dynasty. In our campaign, Hermes starts as a cynical and patient but deceitful ruler. While his cynicism grants his court less piety per month, it also affords our Amir a 20% reduction on religious reformation, rendering theology a natural lifestyle focus. And speaking of focus, the most pressing matter for our court is the repopulation of our indigenous dynasty. Hermuz found fecundity in the form of the Bedouin princess Sajida, and his supplemental secondary spouses also possessed this trait to ensure the proliferation of our progeny. But outside of the bedroom, our political situation became increasingly helpless, as our Safarid sovereign subjugated more and more territory throughout Persia and Central Asia. Before we have a hope to declare independence, we'll first have to bolster our position and expand our emirate externally to the east. To this effect, Hermuz declared war on the valley of Rukchav province in 875 CE, and subsequently conquered the province with the help of his men-at-arms. This was followed by the swift subjugation of Zabulistan, the ancestral homeland of his late family. The state of instability in the Afghani region afforded the hopeful Hermuz the opportunity to expand even further, this time into neighboring Kabulistan. In the following years, war was declared and hard fought against the Valley of Ghazna, plunging the peaks of Pashtun into open conflict until the vanquished valley was captured in his capital. Our head of state now claimed legitimacy as head of the Afghani culture group, and brutally brought the serfs back to their turf as a peasant revolt was crushed in 884. By the following year, the bountiful loins of Bost brought forth Vahuzdan Zunbal to age, the first son of our sovereign and the heir to our emirate. The crown prince then married the genius Habibi Kina Faisal, which ensured the superiority of our subsequent spawnlings. But our expanding family needed power, and in 885, war was declared on the northern valley of Zamandawar. In retribution, the vengeful valley assassinated Vahuzdan, driving our sovereign insane and leaving the realm to Zwadadad in secession. Sharing is caring, and Zwadadad was married to the same Arabic princess as his brother, who had about a week to experience marriage herself before her spouse was slaughtered. Zaman Duar fell in 886, but the realm needed spiritual stability. After all, Hormuz was overwhelmed with stress and opted to journey to Jerusalem in an effort to gain personal piety, which culminated in his theological education and placed the Zunbul dynasty in a position to reform their religion. But it takes a prophet to pull a prophet, and our court needed currency. Hormuz exploited his efforts towards the stewardship life path, which afforded golden obligations. The economy of our country thus revolved around the extortion of our subjects and family members, but money can't buy happiness, and eventually our prince turned to promiscuity to deal with the stress of borrowing money. Of course, this borrowed money allowed the Amir to form the Amirate of Zabulistan in 894, at long last placing our liege in control of his dynastic birthright and first ducky tier holding. But he was far from over. Hermuz then had his henchmen slay the neighboring emirate of Sahihi in advance of an invasion launched in 896. 
With Aragoon captured and conquered, Hormuz granted the land to his second son and began scheming for a way to obtain independence from the tyrannical Amiri Amaran of the Safarid Sultanate. Our liege invited us to a hunting trip, but suffered from an unfortunate accident, leaving his lands to his four-year-old son and heir. When Hermuz pressed the toddler with a demand for independence, the child king was unusually eloquent in his refusal, and insisted that he would, quote, rather die defending what is rightfully his, end quote. Your wish is Hormuz's command. Not a two years later, the child's capital was conquered, and the brat was taken to Bost in captivity. At long last, our nation obtained independence, and in the intervening years, the Safarid Empire suffered successive crippling blows due to their weakness of poor rulership. Not known to look a gift horse in the mouth, our Amir jumped into the fray and easily overtook the neighboring capital of Zaranj and kidnapped the child king for the second time in a decade. This secondary subjugation subsequently afforded our dynasty the Amirate of Sistan, which was given to our sons in keeping with tradition. To our northeast, the Amirate of Kabulistan was reappropriated from the former Safarid Emperor and fell in 908 CE. Further payments were processed from our plentiful progeny, and the Kingdom of Kabulistan was formally founded. Our new kingdom needed a new faith, but converting to Zunism from Sunni Islam is, well, practically impossible, and requires over 100,000 piety. Our king will need to reform Islam itself, and it dawned on Hormuz that solar sharia was the only way forward, in the light direction. This reformed Islamic faith had its tenets changed to conform to the ancient ways of Zunism, while adhering to the surahs of the Muslim tradition. Indeed, it was the dawn of a solar Sharian golden age, and Hormuz acted quickly in an effort to spit out some solar surahs. Kabulistan was the first to be enlightened, and faith soon illuminated into the heretical heartlands of India and Multan. But where the sun rises, it also sets, and in 910 CE, our solar sovereign passed his rule onto his son and heir, Amiri Amirin Zwadadadad. Like father, like son, Amiri's realm survived secession mostly intact, but our new solar sovereign held only the capital province of Bost and a fiefdom in Multan. In an effort to mend the cultural gap between his heterogeneous holdings, Amir divorced his aging wife and traded her in for a Punjabi princess named Puran Tai. This newly coronated Lord of Light subsequently sought to raise an army and illuminate the neighboring hinterlands of heretics. To the north, the Tahirid Emirate was weak and beckoned to Amiri, who subsequently obliged their request to reappropriate their lands and spread the dogma of daylight. Upper Gur was thus forcibly annexed into the rightful realm in 912 CE, followed by Parashubra in India and Nandana to the Far East. All that remained between Amir's Afghani and Indian holdings was the Raj of Lahore, and, in 917, a holy war was declared to subjugate Shorkat under solar sovereignty. The armies of light tirelessly battled the heathens of night, but in a mere ten months, the enemy was extinguished upon the sack and occupation of Shorkat. The Zunbul monarchy was at last contiguous and won, but peace, much like border gore, was never an option. The best shade plans of mice and men is conquest, but Amir's luck soon dimmed as he turned his sights to the remaining realms that bordered him. Any attempt at expansion was increasingly met by a coalition of angry Amirs and vengeful Rajas, plunging his realm into prolonged multi-front wars that boded poorly for internal stability. Despite our lord's noble bloodline, gains in the battlefield translated into settlements of white peas and the preservation of the status quo. Undeterred, the persistent prince pushed against Cahor for the second time a decade later, ultimately annexing the area for our ever-expanding emirate. And speaking of emirates, an ill-fated attempt to revoke crown land for our solar sovereign was met with fire, fury, and a war of tyranny, with outright revolution threatening our throne. Brothers fought brothers, and fathers were forced to fell their fellow countrymen, but in the end, Amir succeeded in the consolidation of his crown provinces, and by 932 the realm was reunited. 
Undeterred from his task of proselytizing Solar Sharia, the Amir thus vanquished Multan, assassinated the neighboring Safarid Sultan, and broke through the lines of the Ducky of Bakar. But while our Lord of Light was merciful with his enemies, he was less inclined to spare those under his own rule. On what should have been an everyday extortion of his vassals, Amir Zwadadad suffered two successive mental breaks, pushing him into an isolation that would prove to be his last. In 940 CE and at the age of 67, Mr. Zwadadad took a burn for the worse, and the 40-year-old Amir II succeeded his father's place upon the solar throne. Though dawn from our world, Amir I succeeded in expanding his father's empire by a factor of two, and will forever be remembered by his friends and family as a benevolent man who selflessly relieved them of their personal power, private property, and fiat currency. Unlike his father, Amir II was a genius and a pragmatic prince who sought to revive the religion of his great-grandfathers. In his point of view, Solar Sharia was but a stepping stone on the path to his dynasty's former claim to fame, and, under his rule, Amir II sought to make the Zunbuls Zunist again. In accordance with tradition, his aging wife was expelled from court, and the wistful widow quickly married his daughter, resulting in pious celebrations that granted the kingdom 500 piety on account of their divine blood. Outside of the affairs of our realm, the universe itself recalibrated and reverted back to the old ways, enabling our solar sovereign to truly take advantage of his present position. You see, with the old ways of the universe in place, you can effectively marry and divorce your family members for an unlimited amount of piety, which comes in handy when the religion you're looking to convert to requires hundreds of thousands of piety. But no amount of piety could save Amir's daughter-wife's daughter, and the decision to invoke one-day temporary marriages and divorce sessions came naturally. Prestige and piety shone like a light from the heavens, and blessed our ruler with thousands of each, though not everyone was happy with this development. The heretical Buddhists of our realm made an attempt on the Lord of Light's life, but their scheme was eagerly extinguished. Days came to weeks, came to months, came to years, and our solar sovereign was simultaneously the husband father and 2,000th time widow to his increasingly doubtful daughter wife. It took a mere four years for Amir to legitimately obtain hundreds of thousands of piety, and, at long last, it was time to praise the sun. In 944 CE, the Zunbul dynasty restored Zunism to the land, and, at long last, our dynasty's daughters and sons would come to be blessed by the very sun itself. But if you flare into the abyss, the abyss flares back, and the starting tenets of the default Zunbul religion leave a lot to be desired. Of course, this excludes sun worship, the radiant tenet that is central to the faith. By default, sun worship allows our liege to judge his captives via sun trial, which is just a fancy way of saying that we can now subject our prisoners to a complimentary tanning session. If they survive the ordeal, they are free to leave, but not everyone can escape Zun's judgment. And speaking of judgment, the default and unreformed faith of Zunism is in need of a reformation. Amir already has hundreds of thousands of piety, and already controls the holy sites of his faith. Thus, in consultation with his court fire priests, the newly reformed Zunism espouses carnal exaltation, preserves the system of sun trials, and exhorts a militaristic worldview. What's more, all true believers are now equals in the eyes of Zun, which subsequently places our firstborn daughter-wife into the first order of heir succession. To commemorate this momentous occasion, the Lord of Light consecrates the dynasty's bloodlines, binding the Zunas faith to the Zunbul dynasty. And speaking of dynasty, family is important, and Amir capitalizes on the opportunity by engaging in polygamy by betrothing himself to his simultaneous daughters and daughters-in-laws. The divine blood of Zunbul now flowed throughout our kingdom, but other fiefdoms were not as enlightened. It was time to burn our bridges with the moribund Safarid state, and in 944 CE, the Lord of Light declared a holy war on Lower Persia. 
our sons marched under our sun and delivered us a glorious victory where we captured the Safarid child king. Our effervescent empire now stretched from the Persian Gulf to the mountains of Kabul. In this egalitarian state, all believers are equal in the eyes of the law, and all non-believers are subject to ultraviolet radiation. But the radiant rays of Zun itself was unable to save our solar sovereign, and in 945 CE, Amir II died under suspicious circumstances. The agents of darkness would soon be put to Zun's judgment, but not before the coronation of Amir II's daughter-wife, the new high priestess Zozan Kichi Zwadadad. Merely 22 years old upon her secession, Zozan inherited her father's son and simultaneous grandson, as well as a kingdom in conflict. Her first order of business was to replace the loss of her late father, and, in keeping with family traditions, she decided to marry her brother, the Shah Zwadadad of Punjab. While nothing could replace her late father-husband, her new brother-husband and simultaneous brother-in-law held command over an allied state that belonged to her empire's de jure borders. By this point in time, the Zunbul dynasty held renown for their convergent bloodline, and in an effort to avoid an evolutionary dead end, the high priestess betrothed herself to her first cousins and not a direct relative. But somehow, this state of affairs deeply shocked the polities along our periphery, and soon, Zozan faced wars from the west and the east, plunging the kingdom into a multi-front war. The heretics of Solar Sharia took the opportunity to rise as well, though the proselytization of their primitive faith was far from welcome. Any rebel who sought to take the Sun Throne would in turn be subjected to a Sun Trial, and Zun was not known to be a merciful cosmic deity. But to his true believers, Zun provided warmth and rebirth, and in 947 CE, Zozan herself gave birth to the divine-blooded and genius sons and daughters Shazda and Banaz. In matters of politics, though, all rebels that survived Zun's trial were forcibly converted to Zunism and stripped of their holdings, allowing for members of our dynasty to take control of their lands. And speaking of lands, our war for the protection for our motherland was not going well. Might makes bright, and the soldiers of the surrounding sultanates plunged Zozan's kingdom into darkness. Thousands of Zunist zealots were judged unworthy of Zun on the fields of battle, and it would take nothing short of a miracle to turn the tides of war to Zozan's favor. To make matters worse, Zozan's martial advisor made advances not of the military kind, and although a nice guy, Zand was too short to be anything but a friend. On the war front, a decade had passed, and the forces of Zozan and the peripheral polities were at an impasse. In 956 CE, a final white peace was ultimately reached, with the Zungbol dynasty able to maintain their territorial integrity. At this point of the video, I'd like to say that the Sovereigns of the Sun went on to raise the world, but, in a burn for the worse, this campaign was lost to the sands of history. Fans of history know that Afghanistan is known as the Graveyard of Empires, but in this case, the Hills of Herat was the graveyard of my solid state hard drive. The drive containing this campaign experienced a total failure during the recording of this campaign, rendering the save file corrupt and preventing me from pressing onwards and conquering the world. That being said, the majority of Iran and portions of Central Asia lie firmly in the control of the Zunbul dynasty and Zuna's faith, and perhaps in an alternative history, the sun would never set on the zealous Zunist empire. Before ending the video, I'd like to thank everyone for watching this far and supporting the YouTube algorithm. If you'd like to see more content and want to help the channel grow, I'd also suggest fabricating a claim on the like button and usurping the channel's subscription box. If you want to boost relations even more, consider donating to our Patreon, buying games through our Nexus store, or donating BAT to Alzebo HD through the Brave browser. That being said, more content is on the way in June, and without further ado, it's time now to roll the credits.